Hello, everybody. Um, so my job here tonight is just to welcome you all. Thank you for taking the time to join us. Um, thank you to WBUR City Space for partnering with Neighborhood Villages uh, to put this event on tonight and for hosting us. I should probably have started by saying my name, uh, which is Lauren Kennedy, and I'm the co-founder of Neighborhood Villages, an organization dedicated to improving access to high-quality, affordable childcare and early education for all families. I am going to leave the details of tonight to the incredible panelists that we have with us. But just to set the stage a little bit uh, is we're gathered here tonight to talk about one of the most pressing economic opportunity issues of this time that often goes completely unacknowledged or isn't talked about in those terms. Uh, when if you turn to your neighbor or you look at the research we see, all families right now are grappling with access to childcare, and all of the research in the world tells us that these first few years of learning, birth to five, birth to preschool, whenever it is that you define school starting, are critical years of learning for young children. So I would argue what we know to be true today are two things. One is that access to childcare and early education is a public good. It's the best investment that we could make with our public dollar. And the second is that access to childcare and early education is a public necessity. We have nearly 80% of parents with young children in the workforce, and cost of living more or less requires a parent to be a breadwinner. So what we'll hear tonight uh, from our panelists is a conversation about how do we think about systems change, or how do we think about different efforts we can make to reform our child care system or to tackle the crisis head on so that we can better meet the needs of families with young children in America today. Before I introduce the panelists, I would love just to get a sense of the room because we're so excited that uh, you're here with us tonight. Would you raise your hand if you are an early educator? And can we all give them a round of applause? So our early educators are obviously the bedrock of our early education system, and we appreciate all that you do. Would you also raise your hand if you are a parent? Thank you for all that you do. You are also an early educator and the bedrock of, of reform and system change. And lastly, a grandparent or a caregiver, uh, because as maybe uh, many of you can attest, grandparents are often filling the gaps so that if your children can't afford childcare or are struggling to make it uh, meet to go to work and raise a family, grandparents are stepping in. So thank you for all that you do. I will now uh, introduce, are, are you coming on stage or I'll hand off to, to Kathleen, our panelists. Um, we have Kathleen McNerney, uh, who will be our moderator tonight. She is the senior producer and editor at Edify here at WBUR. Uh, Dr. Nathan Hendren, uh, who is a professor of economics at Harvard and the co-founder of Opportunity Insights. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend reading a recently published paper they put out that did an assessment of all US social programs and analyzed which generated a return on investment. And I will leave it to him to articulate the grand reveal. And we also have Linda Smith from the Bipartisan Policy Center's Early Childhood Initiative, Early Childhood Development Initiative. Uh, Linda comes to us from Washington, D.C. as a public policy expert and has been on the front lines of reform initiatives. She is also the architect of the U.S. Military Child Care Program, which she will speak more about tonight. And uh, I mention it because many view that as a blueprint for what child care and early education care, uh, uh, early education and care reform could and should look like here in the United States. And then we have Dr. Michelle Sanchez, uh, who is the principal of the Epiphany Early Learning Center in Dorchester. The Epiphany Early Learning Center works with infants, toddlers, preschoolers, and families uh, largely from economically disadvantaged communities here in Boston. So she will um, provide us with the very important perspective of what it's like um, to work in the child care and early education system here in Massachusetts. Thank you all. I shall exit and pass the mic to Kathleen. Uh, 
Um, so thank you all for coming out. As Lauren's um, great introduction said, uh, I'm the editor of the Edify team. We cover uh, education issues from preschool to postdoc. And not only uh, do I feel like coverage of early education and care is so important and personal to me with having a four-year-old and a two-year-old, but that it is, it's not covered enough and certainly not in this market where the gaps are real, the costs are really high, and it's a challenge for many, many families. So it's something that we are following closely and we are putting renewed attention on. So I'm so excited for this panel. We will be um, taking questions at the end for about 20 minutes. My colleague Alex will be walking around with a microphone. So when it's time for questions, just raise your hand and Alex will find you. Uh, to start off this conversation, um, I wanted to kind of ground it a little bit and hear a little bit from you about what you think of when it comes to childcare. So there's an opportunity um, to go to slido.com and I want you to reflect on the question, what is the biggest challenge for you when it comes to your childcare options and choices? Think about that a little bit. See if you can come up with a word or a phrase um, that when you're thinking about childcare options and choices, what comes to mind for you? If you go, go to slido.com, use the has hashtag childcare2020 and send your answer. We'll give you a few minutes, we'll start the conversation and come back to the results. So that's slido.com, hashtag childcare2020. So um, thank you panelists for coming. Michelle, I'd love to start with you just with your experience of the Epiphany School. Tell me a little bit about uh, the Early Learning Center and the families you serve and how you serve them. Sure. Um, so I'll start a little bit uh, beyond where the actually Early Learning Center started. We are a middle school and have been a middle school for 20 years, um, dealing with the same population, same family. Um, and a lot of what just kept surfacing um, as I was doing a lot of my work was around if you can get in earlier and start younger. Um, you could actually have a much bigger impact on what you're seeing in children in middle school. So a lot of the issues that we're dealing with with kids around ADHD and attention and the ways that trauma has affected their just ability to sit in class and learn, the research is very clear that if you can get in very early and work with families and really help the brain develop the way it needs to, then you have a much better chance to have a child who has um, long-term success from there. So we, um, many years ago, started working on the idea around this. And a year, um, maybe two years ago, started working with our first cohort of pregnant moms. And the goal was to get in as early as possible and really work with the families um, to set goals, to try to figure out like what it is that, as a young mom, you need, um, and, and dads as well. We've got um, quite a few dads in the picture. What, you need to kind of be successful as we kind of create this um, high quality child care center that will really nurture and love and care for your, ch your child and at the same time do the same for you. Um, nurture, love, care, figure out whatever thing is getting in your way and how do we address those needs. Um, so we've, we started with a list of what are all the potential obstacles and we tried to build lots of partnerships with different agencies to help us help families deal with these obstacles. Um, and you know, as you can imagine, we've had um, great successes and um, lots more obstacles that we <laughs> learn about as we continue to do uh, the work. Um, and I think uh, you know, lots of the, the lessons um, that we learn every day come from the moms who come in um, and really have learned to trust us, learn to trust the center, to learn to, to build these really significant relationships where they know um, their child is being well cared for and um, they can access different resources um, through the partnerships that we're working now with neighborhood villages and helping kind of create um, this kind of hub of, of uh, services for the family. Yeah, and I, my understanding was some of your partners are with a nonprofit uh, parenting journey 
that offers uh, courses for parents and also the, the Codman Square Health Center. So really holistic, wraparound, intensive work. How many families? So currently we're at 25 families um, and that it, we're still recruiting a new uh, infant class. Um, what we are, because we start with pregnant moms, we're growing the babies up. So, but we also do have a preschool classroom that serves siblings of the, of the pregnant moms that start the center as well. Um, and that has been, uh, the Codman is our referral agency, so that is where um, it's been a great partnership in terms of we are very much on top of the families and the, the parents and the babies' uh, medical needs, but also they are able to have a much deeper touch with families that they know have the need that they maybe can't provide that need for, so they would refer the families to us. Do you have a wait list? How long is it? So we have got, um, that's such a rolling process, um, and because of the way the ages work, um, sometimes we very quickly can tell that we can't, but th there are um, maybe you know, 50, 60 families, and um, we get calls, multiple calls every day um, for people looking for childcare. And those are the most heartbreaking calls to, you know, just automatically be like, nope, there's no room, sorry. Um, because it is such a need. And this is at a, a brand new facility, two acre campus that opened and was up and running a year and a half ago. Yep. And already, already. Um, yep. you know. Yes, I mean, the calls come like to the middle school, to people's cell phones. I'm like, wait, right, oh, how did you get my number? <laughs> um, but it is uh, like, it's really sad. And sometimes people will call daily and sometimes people will just stop in and sometimes people will, um, you know, just really try hard to find, even though you tell them there isn't a space, just the hope that, you know, they'll come in and they'll be like, oh, I really want my child to go here. Um, because it is a place that is very welcoming. And we do try to service families with other um, relationships that we have that who can't actually be part of the center. What's the biggest challenge that, that your families are facing or juggling? Um, housing, major. Um, lots of our families are in shelters or scattered placements um, or um, you know St. Mary's or different types of housing agencies. That is probably the biggest. Um, and then um, jobs and um, finding jobs that um, they can sustain with hours or sustaining jobs in school and you know childcare in the evening if it's trying to do more. Um, we've tried to really work with different agencies around food security, around um, you know different courses to help deal with trauma. Um, so we've created different partnerships where if uh, a diff find career paths or education opportunities. So I think a lot of what we're building is in response to what we've learned are some of the obstacles, but I think the one that we have struggled the most to tackle is housing. Mm -hmm. And it's a sign of, of the prosperity of the city and also the unevenness of that prosperity. And it's a huge challenge, you know, Boston recently ranked as the seventh most income and equal city um, and we, we see, I think everybody kind of sees it day in and day out, how much rent and the median home price has really been increasing um, and how much it varies neighborhood by neighborhood and zip code by zip code, for sure. Um, I'd love to look at our Slido um, answers and, and see what people said, if we can bring it up on the screen. No? Aha. Uh -huh. Uh, so what, which are the best, biggest challenges, sorry, what is the biggest challenge for you when it comes to your childcare options and choice? Uh, cost, quality, expensive options. I also see environments, quality and cost, trust, um, but the, it's, it seems pretty, pretty big uh, uh, consensus on those four. Are any of you surprised about those words? No, I thought it made uh, pretty good sense to see cost and, and quality as the two main things. I mean, I think that uh, uh, comes front and center when we think about the issues we're grappling with here. Um, I, in Massachusetts, the Economic Policy Institute recently had a, a, 
a study that showed that Massachusetts was the most expensive state in the country. The only place in the United States that has higher child care is Washington, D.C. So that for that, uh, infant care is just shy of $21,000 per year on average. For average four-year-old care costs about $15,000 per year. Um, and, and that's pretty much in line with what tuition at UMass costs. Uh, if you go to UMass Amherst, the sticker price is about 16,000, so actually less than infant care. Uh, so it's a, it's a big driver. Um, uh, what's interesting to me, and I guess Michelle or any of the other panelists, why is it so expensive? Why is cost such a big issue? Or if Linda wants to take it. I think Michelle, you could you could start this part of the conversation because she's on the ground and and knows exactly. But I think the cost is in the personnel and to you know because of the redu the ratios that we need to have um, in in terms of caring for infants, especially infants and toddlers, um, that is not cheap. And in most of these programs, and I'm sure Michelle would say the same, it's not just an eight-hour day. It's more like a 10 or 12-hour day. So you're covering more than you know just one you know one period of time. You've got to have more staff than I think most people realize when they when it comes to this issue. Michelle, what would you add? Yeah, to that? No, I would definitely say um, the costs. Um, we are trying to be a center that pays more than the average childcare salary, which I think is something pretty abysmal, like $23,000 or something mm -hmm. that no one can really afford to live on. Um, and by doing that, you're, with the ratios of having three adults, even you know in a classroom of seven people, that alone for one classroom, you see how much that adds up to, and that's not talking, think, talking about food and talking about having staff that mm -hmm. helps uh, families kind of you know, better their situation. Um, so having the situation where you want to honor the staff and pay them well, mm -hmm. and also um, in a career that historically is not looked upon as um, a career people want to get into and have um, job security and have a place to grow. Um, so it's creating this pipeline of teachers. It's finding, um, uh, getting the world to realize how important these early years are and that um, funding should be per provided to pay teachers a, um, a, a livable salary and that they are teachers and not just babysitters. Um, and that is the thing that makes uh, running it very hard. Um, you know, I think about when I was looking for child care and you and really shocked about how much it costs and I ended up moving back to Rhode Island because I couldn't afford child care here in Massachusetts and I went and had my family watch my children um, and commuted back and forth to to, to Boston and to think about now as families are l lucky enough, I'd say, to be able to come to the ELC because um, we're not, uh, we're covering the cost of the tuition for the families. Um, and then thinking about when you're, sent, when you're referring them to other places and you're like, wow, that's a, a really steep amount of money to pay when you're barely making that much mm -hmm. every week. So for 25, 25 families that you're serving in, in ELC, how much does it cost annually to run that program? So we are, let's see, so when we're probably about $1.3 million. And that is um, you know, food service, that is all the um, outreach, the families, that's uh, 13 staff, uh, that's a operations person, a front desk person, mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Um, anybody, you know, the, yeah. I want to jump in on this one because I want to remind the audience that twenty-three thousand um, dollars. Guess what that is in this country? It's federal poverty level for a family of three. So the workforce that she's talking about, we're talking about here. While they're working, they are themselves making poverty wages, and I think that's the struggle that we have with with this whole. Um, we were talking about it earlier, this whole business model that we have in, in particularly childcare. And, and do, you, do you feel like the business model is broken? 
Absolutely. I mean, I, I, and I don't think that most people in this country understand the business model in child care. I'm, I'm now going, we're doing a lot of um, roundtables around the country with businessmen, parents, a lot of different sectors um, in the country. And, and I always start those conversations out with a simple thing. The business model in child care is broken, completely broken. Because when it costs more to produce a product, child care, than the parents can afford to pay, you have a broken business model. And so what are we going to do about that? And you know, and I think we have not put the problem in terms that the public can understand. And I think that's that is a mistake on the part of early childhood people. But it is and then you, you know, we people talk about and we say, okay, they're making poverty wages. Let's say we double those wages. Are we going to double the cost to parents? Then the model would go up to what? About 40,000 here in Boston. And so, I mean, I think this is where we struggle, and, and, and I think that's why we have to rethink this whole system. It, it, it's just not working. Parents, for, for, for those working with the children, for anybody. Mm -hmm. and, I, and Nathan, you've done a lot of interesting work about the benefits of tackling this problem. Can you tell us a little bit about the research that you've done and what you saw happens when you invest in um, child education, child medical care. Sure, um, and I think it relates a lot to this this cost discussion. Um, so we've looked at, historically at the types of policies the government has implemented over the last half century, and the types of policies that tend to have the biggest returns are really investments in children, uh, investments throughout childhood, uh, but especially uh, the, the types of preschool programs that we're talking about right here. And I think when we talk about the business model being broken, um, there's just a simple equation that you're referring to that mm -hmm. determines the cost, right? Uh, we want to pay somebody to, to, uh, uh, to educate our, uh, our children. Um, you have to uh, pay them a good wage if you want a high quality uh, situation in the, uh, in the room. And that then raises the question of who should pay it. And I think that is where the system is broken. Because if you look historically at who has benefited from the types of investments made in, in children, and in particular low-income children, it is not just those children, it is not just those families, mm -hmm. but we all benefit because we all pay when those children don't go down a path that is as good as it could have been. And so if we think about the long-run benefits back to all of us as taxpayers when, those child, uh, when children grow up to not be on uh, uh, other government programs uh, late in life, and instead we think about investing that money early in their life, uh, we can make both that, uh, those children better off, but also decrease the net cost to all of us in the long run. And historically, when you look across the types of policies that we've implemented in the United States, the policies that play this game where you try to invest in children are really the ones that have really paid us back in the long run. And not only that, your research showed that every dollar invested, you get a dollar or more back. On average, historically, when we've invested in children, for every dollar we've put into it, we actually get paid back about a dollar, dollar fifty. Um, now that's historically what we've done over the last 50 years. That doesn't mean that we're always going to get that money back. And just to be clear, that dollar uh, fifty is through reductions in uh, uh, payments that you, you would be making to that child as an adult through earned income tax credits or other welfare type programs, and also through the increase in tax revenue. I'm not talking about the impacts on the children themselves, which are even larger. It's just literally all of the benefits that you put in a dollar when the kid is uh, when the uh, when the child is young, they grow up, they pay back additional tax revenue in the uh, in the future, uh, that looks like in the long run it can actually uh, pay for itself. So the way we think about the cost, the way we think about that twenty or forty thousand dollars, needs to not be just thinking uh, thought of that as just a uh, kind of a sunk uh, sunk cost. It's an investment, uh, and it's an investment in a uh, in an outcome uh, for which we all have a, a pretty strong interest. Mm -hmm. Can I jump in here because Please. I do think that the the question and Nathan sort of hit the nail on the head is this gap between what, you know, what it costs to do this well and what, it, what parents can afford to pay. And what we have yet to figure out in this country is who's going to pay for that gap? Who's going to make up that difference? Because we simply can't pass anything more on to families. It's just not going to work. So who is it? Is, it? is it the federal government, the state government, local government, a combination? What's business's role in all of this? Um, so what's the philanthropic community's role in this. And I think we have yet to sort that out. And I think that is the, the, the question that's in front of us right now. 
because, you know, and I just want to go back and say footnote to what I do in Washington, this still is, this is the one issue in Washington, D.C. that is still, a, you know, a bipartisan issue. It has support on both sides of the hill. People want to know what to do. We need to figure this out so we can give people ideas on what is, who's going to do this. Not just talk about it, but put some concrete suggestions out there for how do we pay for this gap. So if there's this bipartisan consensus, growing research about the benefit and the, the fact that this pays for itself, then what is standing in the way? What is the biggest roadblock? Linda, I'll start with you. Well, I think it is, you know, it's what I said a little bit ago. I don't think we've educated the public on, on the gap, and, and, and we haven't put concrete proposals. And that equates to public will. And we need to do more outside of the early childhood community. I, I no, no offense to all my friends in the audience. We tend to talk to each other, not to people outside of our own circles about this issue. And we need to bring business into this. We need to bring parents in. We need to figure out what parents really want in this. And, and I think those things, we are on us. They're on early childhood people to, to move out of the circle, create this public will. And we don't have a lot of time. I think we are, we are running out of time on this in this country to really figure this out. I'd love to go back to the um, political sort of will and strategy in a little bit, um, but I, I also want to hear your own experience as one of the key architects of the Department of Defense's child care program, um, which is one of the largest employers, mm -hmm. <laughs> employer-run programs in the U.S. What was that experience of, of putting that together? Why was there political will around that time in the in the late 80s am i right yeah. to yeah. to make this happen what was the calculus well there were a number of factors that came together at the at, you know in the 80s that sort of pushed the department of defense to do more one of them started out as i think a lot of people know with we had a, a child sexual abuse allegations they were there were several in the country we had them in the military so that put the spotlight on what's going on here in, in child care. Then we also, women came into the military, could stay in the military, have a baby, stay on active duty. And that changed the dynamic in the military completely. So the pressure was on, what are we going to do about this? And the military figured out pretty quickly when they transformed from a, um, a conscript, which is basically a draft, to an all-volunteer force, that they needed to do more to attract people into the military. And they weren't going to do that by not providing certain things. So these things came together, and it put pressure on the, on the whole system to figure this out. Because the second point was, and I think this is not unlike what's going on in this country right now, military are separated from family. They don't have extended family. So there wasn't a lot of support there. And if the, we, the military didn't do it, then who would? And so, and I would also say in back when this all happened, and I think this is something business needs to deal with in our country, the military, in, around the time this happened, we were recruiting about half of the military force from military families. So they, they were kids that had been raised in the military, coming into the military, and quickly understood that if they didn't know how to, you know, use the weaponry or the technology, they were going to train them, so we might as well do this early. They got that connection. All that you're talking about, Nathan, was kind of understood. And so how did we keep it, the cost down to the families at the same time? The quality was an issue because of some of the abuse and some of the other allegations that had gone on. So we had to figure that out and fast. And in, not to say it was just, you know, the department. Congress was really engaged in this. And... The, the model, and not to take too long on this, the, the model for the military was essentially um, a 50-50 match between the government, uh, pu uh, public funds, federal um, appropriated dollars, and parent fees. Mm -hmm. On average, with low-income families paying less than high income, but everyone in the military gets a break. So you can be a colonel you know, and get a, a, a roughly in those days, and I, I don't know what it is exactly today, but in w when we set this up, the, the highest income, the pilots, 
got a third off, and the lowest income got two thirds off. But on average, it was a 50-50 match. And, I, and with a big public commitment, and that was not easy. You know, it wasn't um, something that was, you know, anybody really planned on doing, trust me on that one. Um, but it, I think they, as we move through the process, um, the, you know, we, we, we kind of, we got to this, this match, but it was, um, and I want to just say, back up and say one thing, just for the record, people, that there, there is no um, appropriated fund uh, dollars that are, you know, that are directed towards that program. The, the program goes to the budget table in the Pentagon and fights for dollars just like everybody else. So it's, it's, I think sometimes people think, oh, they were given that money. Oh, no, 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 trust me, we were not. Um, but that said, um, I just want to make one other point, is that the 50% of the public dollars going into the military program goes to pay the wages of the workforce. And we then were able to require training of all of our workforce. And as they completed the training, they got a pay increase. And as they moved up, they could go to a certain level. But the appropriated fund dollars paid for that piece of it. So that allowed us to keep the, way, the, the fees down for the parents. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how that's, you know, that's, it's a little bit complicated, but I want to just say the final thing I would say about the military system that I think is important that everybody understands. It, and I think it's where we're also making a little bit of an error in thinking about solutions in, on a broader scale. Just tackling one piece of this puzzle is never going to work. And we had to tackle all of it at one time. We had to improve the, the workforce. We had to deal with the pay. We had to figure out the 50-50 match. And we had to do, do all of those things at once. If we just continue to talk about paying teachers more without figuring out how we're going to get that, 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 that gap closed, it, we're just going to squeeze the bubble, and it's going to pop out somewhere else. So we had to deal with the inspections at the same time. We had to clean it up. We had to work on the workforce. We had to make it affordable. And I worry that our country tends to look for the one solution that's going to fix it all, and there isn't one. One interesting thing that I, I think of when I think of um, the military is that often families are moving around and, de and deployed in different areas. So quality and consistency Mm -hmm. really, really matters. Yeah. Is, it, is that the focus on training and development of staff, mm -hmm. was that key to creating consistency so that if a, if a kid middle of mm -hmm. kind of the school year or preschool year was moved to, you know, California or Fort Knox exactly. or whatever? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And, yeah, and did you, once you've left, as you're looking at kind of the market-based um, economy for child care. I would just love if you could tell us a little bit about the consistency in the, the military system mm -hmm. versus consistency and quality in the civilian. Well, the consistency was there. Um, we had to, we developed a single training program for, the, for all of the military services, so everyone used the same model. Essentially, the Child Development Associate credentialing program was where we started, moved people up to a CDA level got them to a certain pay. So no ma and this the workforce could move within the system. So if you were tr you know say transferred from Knox to California base in California, the training was the same and you could pick up where you left off. And you could also be hired at the level that you left your last base. So you didn't take a cut and pay to take that transfer. I think the other thing that was important about it is that we set a goal um, for having 50, well, actually, in the law, it required us to, to nationally accredit 50 programs. That was the original goal. We set the goal internally within DOD that all programs would get to um, NAYC accreditation, and we reached that goal. We had 100% of our programs, I think, by about 1997 or 8, nationally accredited with that model of training uh, and consistency. So no matter where a family went, they would get a level of quality that was, was pretty solid, pretty good. And I would just, hearing this, and this isn't the first time I've heard of it, because I know Neighborhood Villages has worked a lot around kind of figuring out how to mm -hmm. 
make the same model for all kinds of childcare. Um, it really like brings to mind that you know childcare should not be a privilege. It should be a right for all families. And I think that is where like figuring out how to fix this gap and where the money comes from, and maybe modeling some of the pay scale and thinking about you know I think it's seven percent that families should be paying for child care and you've got families who are paying you know 40 50 percent of their income mm -hmm. on child care and how do we fix this incredibly broken system um, and I know you know there are lots of kind of things happening and thinking about how to do this and it sounds like you're doing a lot of work um, but I do feel like the conversations are beginning to happen and now um, that there's just lots of science around the benefit of the early of, of really good quality uh, early child care that um, there is enough evidence out there to say um, this has to be a priority and we can't um, leave it to chance and that there's got to be um, a, a system in place that makes this um, a, a responsibility uh, that everyone feels called to take care of. Okay, Linda, go ahead. Well, the other thing I was going to add to the the consistency equality that we that the military did, and I think it was when the Military Child Care Act passed, which drove a lot of the change. It really was specific to centers, and we made a decision in in the Defense Department in our policy, not in our in the law, but in the policy, to treat all components of the system the same. So in other words, if you're a family child care provider in the military, you get the same training, not exactly the same because the setting is different, but the same model applied to family child care, to school age care, to part day preschool, all of it. So people were all getting that same level. And I think that was, again, a way that helped us not destabilize our own quote unquote market. Because, and I said to, I remember saying to the assistant secretary I was working for at the time, uh, the rationale for bringing the family child care into this system would be if you think about how many children we have in family child care, do you want to build a center for all of those children? And he kind of looked at that. And he was an economist, by the way. <laughs> and he kind of looked at that and he said, no, don't think so. That would be very expensive. So let's treat, let's bring family child care in and treat it the same. And I think we, we are struggling with that yet in this country. Um, of sort of what and, and to you know parents do want choices and family child care should be one of those choices yeah and and we see there's so many different you know <laughs> constellations that people put together some for economic need but also choice of whether it's a nanny share or a center-based care or family or a home-based daycare and i it seems to me like we don't have a full understanding about the range of quality and how there can be, you know, high quality and low quality in each of those settings. There's interesting work being done to try to get at that issue. And I know the state is looking at its uh, own quality metrics um, and revamping those. Uh, but it, it, it's the quality and access sort of conundrum um, is a challenge. I, I'm, I'm curious, and I think, Linda, you were saying before we came on stage that you, as you've been traveling the country, you've been hearing this pushback um, from people who maybe don't have children. Why should anyone who is childless subsidize somebody who has children? If this person, you know, I've, I've made a choice to have two children. I should figure out how to pay for that. And I sh and maybe that means a tough choice of, of giving up my job. Uh, you know, Nathan, I'm curious, what's, yeah. what is the case for, for us to, to pay for somebody else's so, children? So you want to know pay? why an economist with no kids would, yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, would be all for uh, uh, subsidizing no child care, it's right? Fine. No, it's, that's true. <laughs> Um, no, I think that's exactly the right question. I mean, I think it comes back to two real issues of why I think that, you know, frankly, just out of my own personal interest, I am better if we are subsidizing childcare in this country. Um, and I think it is first, it comes back to the argument we just made before that children who receive these early life investments and these investments throughout their childhood grow up uh, to have uh, more prosperous careers and they pay back more in tax revenue than we have to spend when they are young. Um, I think the other is that it comes back to, I think, the military experience is that it fosters the career trajectories of parents as well, and it allows parents to make those choices. Now, 
I, I don't have a particular preference on whether a, a parent decides to stay at home to raise a child or whether they decide to work and put their, their child into child care. But I do know as an economist that if that parent decides to no longer work, that I now have to pick up more of the federal tax burden, right? That person is no longer contributing back into, uh, uh, into, the, uh, uh, into the Treasury. Now, that's a, a very cold reason to sort of uh, uh, kind of come at there, a cold way of coming at this question. But hopefully it can bring more people to the table to really understand that the actual cost of these subsidies is much lower than you would have thought. Mm -hmm. um, it both fosters career trajectories of parents and it, it can improve the outcomes of, of kids, both of which pay us all back. Um, and so I think bringing that into the equation, this becomes, of all the types of policies we talk about, these, these policies just don't cost as much as what the sticker price looks like. And the sticker price is big. I mean, we're talking billions yeah. of dollars from what the national... Uh, well, it's nothing like the corporate tax cuts, but... <laughs> 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 but this is actually, you know, we talk about, uh, you know, the, the Treasury Secretary likes to talk about a free lunch with, associated with these corporate taxes and argue that they would pay for themselves. Um, you know, I don't want to sit here and say that they definitely have not paid for themselves, but I will say that there is definitely no good evidence to suggest they have. Whereas I think we now have a, a large body of evidence that suggests these types of investments in, in children. Mm -hmm. um, and in particular, our rash rationales for additional subsidies to low-income families who are uh, uh, kind of in, in greater distress for, for trying to find these options, um, that those uh, uh, do have this, this property where they, uh, uh, they pay us back. And so if, you know, hopefully that, you know, if we can get uh, people who are, are interested in finding policies that pay for themselves, um, here they are. We're talking about them. And to just drill down a little bit, when we're talking about paying them back, I mean, it, it, your research has shown they're, they're more likely, children who are, um, they're more likely to go to, to college, have higher earnings, right? That There's these dividends yeah. beyond, I, I think we often get stuck on thinking about the um, fade out effect of academic gains in mm. early years and that debate about whether the academic gains from preschool as they phase out yeah. uh, kind of by third grade. But you, if you take a step back and look more holistically, what kinds of advantages do you see for the individual? Yeah, so th there's a lot of debate about um, you know individual programs that have been implemented over the course of the past uh, uh, the past 50 years, and there is definitely variability. Some of which have had uh, larger effects than others. Um, but historically, when you look at, at policies that have targeted children throughout their childhood, um, it looks like policies that, uh, on average, those policies are are paying us back. And uh, I think the the model you want to have in mind is that. Growing up in a better environment, every year we spend in childhood growing up in a better environment improves our outcomes in adulthood on a wide range of different dimensions. Um, children who grow up in better environments are less likely to uh, be incarcerated, more likely to go to college. They're going to pay. Uh, they're going to grow up and earn more money, pay higher taxes. Um, there's just a, a suite of benefits when you are exposed to better environments throughout your childhood um, that uh, accrue both to that child and back on to uh, uh, to to us all. Uh, and so the question here is not what's the, the sticker price. The question is what's the net cost to all of us. And I think th this is a case where the net cost is quite different. Can I just talk a little bit about that, if the fade out that you bring yeah. up? Because I, having worked, you know, uh, in, in the, the, the administration on the Head Start issue, and that comes up, <clears throat> excuse me, all the time with, with the Head Start. Actually, Head Start gets children to school on a par with their peers. What happens after that? I, I'm not sure I think that, you know, one or two years worth of Head Start, it can compensate for what happens in K through three years. And I think we need to stop pointing a finger at some of the early childhood programs as failing because something has happened between those other years. And, and Michelle, I would get it. You, you said it earlier about the importance of, I mean, it's important for kids to get to school ready and you saw the need for pushing down, you know, starting earlier. But it, there's also this responsibility after school, they get to school too, that I, I, I think we, I, I get frustrated with that argument, to be honest with you. So. <laughs> and Michelle, I, I, you're in a very interesting position because you have an early learning center and then a fifth through eighth grade, which I, I'm not prepared for the middle school years, so I'm going to call you yes, <laughs> when I get there. But what is your experience when you have fifth graders entering epiphany school? 
um, where are they academically and what does it take to kind of yeah. help them get on track? Yeah, so that's, that's the meat of the work that we do. It's a full service school. Um, majority of the students come in academically behind, really kind of unable to sit in a class, really struggle uh, attention. Not every single child, um, but there's definitely, you know, 70% of our kids who do individual therapy, um, all of our kids who do kind of gr groups to kind of process and just kind of help deal with the everyday traumas and the everyday things that happen. Um, and um, learning from this and knowing that even though they're you know, whatever happens in school that does cause the fade up or causes our fifth graders to come, sometimes reading at a second or first grade level, um, there is real science around how much you could affect a child if you can get in those first three years and help that brain develop the way it's supposed to, regardless of, you know, what happens, at least, you know, you know, that brain is, is, has a good opportunity to then be able to later do math and later read and, uh, you know, that's not going to be able to, although trauma does continue to, to nag at that, but if you know you're helping the child and you're helping the families understand how important it is to, um, you know, protect them from that trauma while you work with the babies and you're also working with the families, you're really kind of doing that work. Um, and, and, you know, the, the return is not only in the babies that will grow up, but also in the families that you're giving an opportunity to give their child a, a a safe, trusting environment while they can go off and go to school or go to work and better themselves. So you've got two generations that you're then hopefully helping um, improve the quality of life for. What change do you notice in families from the beginning of the school year to the end? For uh, the ELC or for, for ELC or I mean or middle school if you feel it's relevant. I'm just curious of with that kind of support um, and intensive, you know, working yeah. with and partnering with parents. I think there there are some um, major uh, success stories, and there are still some families who have things that happen to them that throw things way behind. So it may be a death, mm -hmm. it may be a, um, a housing issue, um, and I think. Uh, but one of the things that we've really seen is that we've got parents who've come to trust our environment. I think there are some here that maybe we could ask that who've come yeah. to who've like trust. <laughs> Um, who come to trust our center, who come to trust us, who come to um, know that we're there to kind of help them and support them. Um, and f for them, I think that is a really uh, uh, very kind of helpful thing to know to have, that you've got this safety net. And same thing for the middle school. We see the families, you know, when you know you've got this team of people um, who, you know, will take your, your child and kind of work with you and them it's just this, this sense of like, okay, like I'm go things are going to be okay, even when they feel overwhelming and like they're not going to be okay. I, I don't know if any of the families and Alex, if um, if one of the families would would like to talk a little bit about kind of your experience of how did you end up at Epiphany? Hi, do you mind saying your name and? <laughs> Hi, my name is Kwame Shi Myers. Um, came to the Epiphany um, last year um, in the first, my, my, one of my, two of my children, three of my children are in the uh, Epiphany. Um, and um, they are the best, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> they help with um, everything that Ms. Sanchez said. They really help and they really care and they really um, do beyond for our families um, in the school. So. What was it like as you were looking for childcare? What were you finding before you found Epiphany? Well, mother of five kids, it's really hard um, finding childcare for my children. Um, and um, I was kind of really sketchy about the Epiphany at first. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and um, when I went there and looked around and, you know, um, seen how it was and see how they talk, like the children and stuff like that. So um, that really made me feel comfortable and trusting um, the staff there and my children. What was the biggest uh, or most important thing for you as you were looking at child care options? Was it cost? Was it cost? Uh, me, mainly, not so much cost because we do have vouchers, but the trust for me is everything um, with leaving my children with total strangers. <laughs> um, yeah, so. Thank you. So it feels like we know the stakes. 
made a very provocative argument as to why we should do this, uh, why we should um, invest in early, early years. It still comes down to the question of, of how, you, how you do it. And uh, I'm curious, maybe Linda, if you can weigh in, that there seems to be a debate about increasing access and then we're first and then worrying about quality later or you know which, which comes first do you improve quality and then try to expand access do you try to do both well i think it gets back to what i said about the what we did in the military i don't think you can do, pick one you we have to do it all and and that's where it gets hard um, but but it it can be done i think the military is a model that works i mean we we're talking about it earlier 200,000 children in that system on a daily basis and it is, it is quality. Um, but it's not going to be easy, and we, we really need to get specific about what needs to happen, not just, I, I said to somebody not too long ago, and I, I thought, oh, they probably hate me from now on, because they were talking about, you know, well, what needs to happen? Well, we need, you know, and they went on and on with the platitudes, you know, and, and I said, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Tell me specifically what we, you think we need to do. Because you can tell me over and over again that we need to raise the wages and that the, we need to do the quality. But what is it that's going to make this thing turn around? And those words are not working with policymakers, with anyone. They're looking for specifics. What do you want from us? And, and I think it can't be just one thing. Because we've got a quality thing, we need to figure out, I think, a pathway not it's an either or, but a pathway that's going to get us, uh, you know, to, to where we need to go, because it's not going to happen. I I say to people, and they would talk about some of the legislation that's been proposed and how much the billions of dollars. And you mentioned the cost. Um, if you were to give us a hundred billion dollars tomorrow, we couldn't spend it. So what's the plan to get us to that from here to there? That's what we need to figure out, and we have it. Um, we have ideas, and we're trying to put piece it together um, in terms of a strategy. But um, you know, I think we we've got we've got to figure it out, and it's not either or. I just won't, I, I can't answer that question. Yeah. So, wh what is the answer? Well, <laughs> You, have you figured it out? <laughs> well, I think what we're trying to figure out right now is getting back to what Nathan was saying is who's going to pay the gap? We have, we don't, there's two things I don't think we as a country know. We are working on, uh, on them right now. One that we don't know is exactly what is the gap? How much do we have and how much do we need? And we are working state by state. In fact, Massachusetts is part of our first cohort of states where we've actually started to look at this. So what do you have? What do you need? And then the next step is what is it going to cost to fill the gap? And I think we need better cost models for some things. We've got fairly good models for center-based care. We need better cost models for what's it going to cost us to do family child care well. Um, some of those those other programs have yet to be costed out. But you know, I, I would say again, I feel like I'm harping on the DoD model again. I didn't intend to do that, but. Um, one of the things that we were required to do in DOD was to, Congress said, tell us how much you have and what do you need and how much is it going to cost us. That was a question they posed to us. We had to figure it out and we had to report it to them. We're trying to do that now for the country to get 50 state comparison data on what's the gap and what are we, and, and then the accompanying cost of that. Because otherwise, what, you, again, we have no plan. Um, and so that plan for give, if you, we could do that and then give the states options on how to fill the gap that, and here's what it's going to cost you now, put your resources, your worst hurt first. And, and again, that's sort of the approach that we used, um, back with the military, start where it, you had the biggest unmet need and try to fix it. Yeah. And it makes me think of a, a recent Boston foundation report that showed just in the city, um, if you solely looked at the number of children versus the number of seats available for kids ages zero to two, there was a 74% unmet need. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's uh, they don't actually know if those parents need, that's right? right? That's it's, right. it's a totally a numbers game without actually polling parents about not only what they need, but what they look for, because 
I think in this day and age, every every parent has different work schedules that they're cobbling together. Um, so the coverage that they need may not actually fit in that nine to five. Right. Yeah. And that's one of the things that we've, I, I'm pretty convinced in the work that we've done in the very recently in the last, say, six to eight, six to eight months. And it was interesting to watch this and, and also hear your parent out there say this. We're not completely sure what parents really want for the most part. I think we have some ideas, but I think there are a lot of assumptions about what they want. And I think it's another one of our big gaps in terms of how do we get parents to to participate in the solutions. Because a lot of the child care programs around the country are maybe seven to six or you know six to six or something like that. A lot of parents are not working those hours. So how do we begin to look at parents' needs versus capacity, not just you know sort of the, the seats as you're talking about? Um, I think that, that we've got a lot of work to do on that. And we're trying, we're, we actually have been doing a lot of parent Focus groups, a lot of parent polling on this one to try and figure it out. Just want to wrap up the conversation, then we'll open up to questions. Um, Nathan, I, I'm kind of curious, this this question of who pays that Linda is posing from the view of an economist, um, who should pay? Is it is it businesses? Is it parents? Is it the federal government, state government? I mean, who is shouldering or sharing this burden? I mean, I, I think it's going to be a mix of parents and the, and frankly, I think in the, the, the best model of the world, it would be the federal government picking up a decent chunk of the tab because they're the ones that lose out uh, when uh, careers are shortened as a result of the absence of child care and when children grow up to either receive more in, in, in federal benefits or pay less in, in, in federal taxes are the ones that have the biggest stake in this game. Um, and so I think that generally makes a, a natural case for a national cohesive policy towards child care in the U.S. Now, uh, that doesn't answer the political question of what is the right political path to get there. That could be very different. But I think in the long run, we need to have a national policy targeted towards, uh, uh, towards child care. And, and Linda, as an observer, do you feel we've been hearing more about it with this administration in large part because of Ivanka Trump's interest in this issue, um, several presidential candidates have put forward their own proposals. Mm -hmm. Do you think there is will that this could actually get done, or is it more blah, blah, blah platitudes? I know, that's gonna, my famous sign from <laughs> now on. Um, no, I think there's there's political, I think there's the will to do something. Um, and I, you know, I, I just think we have to be more specific about it. And I would agree with Nathan that I think the country as a whole tends to benefit a lot from it. But any solution that we put on the table is going to have to, I think it has to be in some balance of federally driven, f federally supported with the states having some flexibility on sort of how they approach the problem. Because we've been, in the last month I've been in Montana and Oklahoma, and trust me, they're so different than the, the either coasts. You know, so we have to allow for the states to do some things and, and figure out how to give the um, to get the funding out there with some with accountability though not just block grants and give them and let it happen we need it ha to figure out how to get the accountability into those federal resources whatever they are whatever percentage it is with 50 50 whatever it is well thank you all I really appreciate it I'd love to open up and hear from questions from the audience uh, Alex has a microphone so just hold your hand and he will find you and if you don't mind um, just stating your name and where you're from before your question. My name is Lourdes Sariel, and um, I spent many years in the family child care system world. So, Linda, my question to you is that about something that you said that just resonated about educating the public. And for anything to be successful, it has to be driven by the user, and in this, parent, this case, the parents. And we had an initiative in Massachusetts um, years back, led by Margaret Blood, that was um, started to be very successful, and then there was a lot of work done both on the state and the local level, and then it just kind of petered away. But again, it goes back to how do we get the user, in this case the parents, because that's what's going to drive this change, is really the parents. I mean, all of us who work and 
you know, who do all this wonderful work is just not enough. And I think parents, you know, they lead a very busy life. And like the parent from your school, Michelle, and other parents that we encounter at all income levels, you know, they, they don't, they need, they need help articulating what it is that they need. And I think that's what you were speaking. So how do we get that going? How, what do we do to keep, to keep it going? Cause it, it started, but what do we do to keep it going? Thank you, Lourdes. Well, I think that we do need some type of a national um, media effort on this one. I think one of the things that we've learned in the work that we've done over the last couple of years is that we don't have, and I think we, we're stuck in certain ways in the early childhood community, we're still selling the neuroscience. We don't have to sell that anymore. This country understands it. And I would say that, you know, like our our parent, or our polling results show that it's in the 90s percent uh, get the, the science. So we don't have to sell that anymore. So, so I think we're beyond that. So what, what, but again, to parents, how are we engaging them in this topic beyond just telling them how important it is? And I think that that's, that's something that we're trying to figure out, to be honest with you. I don't know that I have the answer. I think that there's another piece, though. It's, it's parents, and I think the other missing piece is our businesses. Because if there's a group of people in this country that benefit from child care, it's businesses. And we've talked to businesses who are, you know, we talked to one business out in St. Louis where they were, this woman told, runs a company, medium size. Her losses in her business due to child care failure, they figured it out as $120,000 for a medium sized business. So, okay, so how do we get to business and help them understand that they have a role to play without asking them to do it? Because I think too often we go to the business and say, okay, we need for you to provide it. And it's not their work. It's not their line of work. So again, I think it's parents and businesses. And it's parents, in some ways, working, getting parents talking to businesses about this. Not in a way that's saying, give it to me, but help me figure this out. And, and I, I think, I, I can't sit here and say that we have the answers yet, but we're, we're really trying to figure this out. Hi, I'm Jeannie Mills, and <clears throat> I work for the National Center on Child Care Subsidy and Innovation. We provide TNTA resources for states around child care subsidy. Linda, you're ta you talked about a role for states, and I'm curious what you think about the fact that there are no national standards for child care like there would be for DOD child care. There is certainly national standards for Head Starts. Um, the programs have lots of flexibility in how they meet them. But what what would you think about, and you said you don't agree with just simply block granting money to the states. What do you think the role is of the federal government of standardizing quality through some kind of regulations, mm -hmm. you know? You know, I think we already have them. And one of the things that we were trying to do when we, we, as many in this room know, we rewrote both the child care regulation and the Head Start performance standards at the same time in, in, in HHS when, when, in the last administration. And I, we tried very hard to, to make sure that they aligned, that they're not fighting each other with, the, with a couple of exceptions, which we couldn't control, and that's eligibility. Those things we could not change. But I've always, in my head, seen the, the minimum that we have now. We finally put a floor under child care with the Child Care Development Block Grant. We got some minimums, very minimal, but we got them. And I think what we want states to be thinking about is taking programs from those minimums to the level of the Head Start standards. Let's not go down the road of trying to suggest national standards. Anybody, you know, that is not going to fly. But we already have them in some ways with the Head Start performance standards. And so can we figure out a way to, when I say these pathways to things, can we figure a pathway between minimum and maximum in this country and use what we already have, not recreate? Because I think the minute you say federal standards, you know, the conversation is over. And I did. I, I don't know if that answered your question or not. Yeah, I think the issue for me is thinking about the wide variation around childcare licensing from state to state. 
mm -hmm. staff child care ratios, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, and I agree with you that the, the block grant has set a, a, a much better floor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. It, uh, you know, one of the things that we learned, and I don't want to monopolize this, you guys, so, uh, you know, in the early Head Start child care partnerships, when we set those up, and those, we have several models. In fact, I was, the reason I was in Oklahoma is the ounce of prevention put out a report on looking at the states that had uh, used the, that, those partnerships to improve standards across the board. Some states got grant, uh, the Head Start performance, uh, or I mean the uh, early Head Start childcare partnership grants. And that actually did bring about changes in, in some states. And so I think that there's, there's something that we can learn from that model in trying to help states understand some of the things that we're talking about here. I, I used to hear, oh, the Head Start standards, we could never meet those. When they really dug into them, they began to realize what they really were. They weren't that all that hard. And so I think it's, it's a matter of getting our own field to think about these things a little bit differently. Um, hello. Uh, my name is Karen, and I actually live in western Massachusetts, but I came in to the city just so I could come tonight. And my daughter said, why are you doing that? You know everything about that. And I said, yeah, but I don't know what happened to the system. I started as a Head Start teacher, and then I worked for the community um, mental health program with um, infant toddlers, preschoolers, Massachusetts has been such a leader. I mean, there's so many programs that we started that got into federal um, funding, federal regulations, the early intervention programs, the uh, um, in uh, education for children with uh, disabilities. Um, I mean, there, there were a lot of things we did, and I was involved in all of those, and I loved um, Margaret Blood, who used to say, if, uh, if you're a child care advocate, it's like you're, uh, it's a life sentence. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I guess that's the problem. Um, and uh, um, so uh, I was surprised when uh, Nathaniel said that the payback is a dollar, dollar fifty. Perry Preschool Project said, it's four dollars for every dollar spent in early childhood. Yeah. Yeah. So just to clarify on that, so we're actually using the same data. Um, they they're including the benefits to the individuals themselves for sure. And if you do that, then the payoff is is much uh, is much higher. Uh, but if you just look at the benefits to all of us as, as taxpayers, it's a dollar. Uh, it's in the. It's actually just slightly below a dollar. Mm -hmm. um, and Absolutely. And welfare and uh, whether or not they complete high school. As a Head Start teacher in 66, I then had a reunion of my Head Start class when they were graduating from high school. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, uh, and I always thought I should write up that particular uh, program because yeah. everything they, they talked about really was true in my classroom. But in 1980, was when, or 1981, I became the Head Start teacher for Cambridge and Somerville. And at that point, the, um, uh, the, the class size went from 15 to 20, and it went from three teachers, or three adults, to two. Yeah. Thank mean, you. So it's so interesting to hear your history, and I appreciate you coming in all the way from Western Mass and all of the work that you've done with this population. I, I'm really curious, based off of what you've been telling us and seeing about the, the changes that you've been experiencing, I don't know, Michelle, if you have any thoughts um, about why, why we are where we are today. Why do we have this kind of what Linda has called a broken system and and uh, you know I don't know if you have any insights from from your from running a school yourself I mean I think it's just kind of general inequities to, in, to access um, you know there's in everything in the education system 
in healthcare, in, in kind of everywhere, what, you know, everyone get is not equal. And where we are, we're, you know, in this place where we're serving families who are getting the least, who probably need the most. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, you know, what we're seeing every day in the population we're serving. And I think what's so interesting is she brings up the Perry Preschool Project and the work that you do, even though that was only a, a small cohort, it was 60 children that were in the program, <coughs> excuse me, the teachers did home visits. And it's similar to your work um, of working directly with the parents. And I think that can't be um, overstated enough, that kind of intensive work with parents and support for parents, as well as the, quali the high quality preschool classroom environment. A big piece of what we do in our middle school that we'll also do in the Early Learning Center is follow our graduates forever. So our oldest graduates are 33 and we follow them through um, you know, where they've gone to high school and college and careers and family. And um, it, although it will be probably much more difficult making sure that we're keeping uh, track of where all of these guys go because at five-year-old you haven't made your own attachment so it's going to be the work of holding on to the families and making sure that those kids are in good um, academic programs and have summer out things to do in the summer and after school and really kind of committing to their long-term growth and development and being able to just kind of watch and see how their outcomes hopefully will be you know like your class uh, and when they're 18 years old, they'll be all graduating and doing, going on to do great things as well. Hi, I'm Amy O'Leary at Strategies for Children, which is the organization that Margaret Blood created, which we're still there 20 years later. Um, and I think, Linda, I think part of the challenge why we haven't made as much progress is the blah, blah, blah. Um, we have political support. We Everyone gives me thumbs up when they see me coming in the state house. And I would say the headline in Massachusetts is we have a lot of pieces of the puzzle, but it's not put together yet. And I think we just had a Massachusetts K-12 funding ed reform where we are getting an additional $1.5 billion on top of what we already get because that community came together, you know, filed a bill, compromised, and, and had a plan. So I would love to hear, um, and Michelle, the story that um, last summer when the Wonder of Learning exhibit was here, one of the moms who was pregnant, who was visiting your program, walked into the classroom and said, you did all this for my baby. And wouldn't we want every parent that shows up somewhere to feel that welcomed? But as you all think about, and the political path, right? We need the political path. So kind of in your experience, you think about federal, state, and local. If you could talk from, you know, what's going to help us put these pieces together to think about how we can help to really move the needle and come up with a plan. What have you seen other states do and achieve? You know, I think one of the, the things that I think has been the most important in, in a long time has been the preschool development grants. And I think they are really starting to help states think this through. Um, and I think the more we can take a look at some of those types of systematic changes in, in sort of our governance in our state systems, bring these pieces together. And, you know, I think this is something where the early childhood community, I'll go out on a limb here and just say it, I think we're going to have to start thinking a little bit differently ourselves because we, we are stovepiped. And I think we perpetuate stovepipes in early childhood for a whole host of reasons. Some of them is just scarcity of funds, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it is really time for people to, to stop that, rethink this, and figure out how all pieces of this come together in some way that makes sense for parents. You know, it, it actually happened to me here in Massachusetts several years ago when I visited a program. Uh, I, I wanted to see what it was like for families who were going to apply for subsidies here in, Mass in, in the Boston area. And I'm like, my goodness, how hard have we made this? I, I mean, it was, it was amazing to me how hard it was on families. So can we as an early childhood community pull together, not think of it from our, where we sit, but think of it from where the families sit and how hard are we making it on them? And if I think we approach this from the, that outside in rather than just this inside look at ourselves, we might get somewhere. And the preschool development grant is, are giving us the opportunity to do that.
I hope. I think they are in most states. In states that are really working hard on this, I think um, I could go across. Massachusetts has always been a standout state. They, they're, they're really trying to tackle it. Washington is trying really hard. Uh, California's got a big, but I'm not going to skip over some of these states in the middle because some of the states, they call themselves the flyover states, are really doing some interesting things too. So I think there's lessons to be learned from a lot of, of states, but I think it's, we, we really think about it from the parents' perspective in. What are we doing for these people? And I think that's what you're saying, Michelle. You, these programs have become the safety net, social safety net for parents in many ways. I don't know if that answered your question, Amy, but. Hi, I'm Mary Kay Leonard. I've worked in this space for a long time. Um, a question for uh, Nathaniel. Um, is there any really good research on the economic benefits to employers right now? So the military was challenged to make sure that they were going to recruit people into the military so that they could be helped then. What it, I mean, I'm, I fear that 20 years down the road return is an awful long time for us to have an attention span. So what's, what's the data that, about the current workforce that we can use, both with employers as well as with government? Yeah, that's a good question. And I mean, the short answer is that it's not as good as the, the evidence that we have uh, uh, for the kids themselves. Uh, the closest evidence we have comes from uh, child care subsidy expansions uh, that uh, have been shown to help uh, keep parents in the, in the workforce. Now, that's not necessarily saying that there's any benefit to the firms themselves necessarily from those, uh, those families staying in the, uh, in the workforce because parents can move across different places. And I think one of the reasons the military has a stronger incentive to implement a uh, program like it did is that people stay in longer careers in the military much more uh, frequently. We, we would like them to <laughs> more more than um, um, many other other firms. You know, people often hop between firms throughout their careers, and that can be a productive career trajectory for many people in the in, in the twenty first century workforce. So, I, I think that naturally makes it harder for a given firm to uh, make these uh, uh, these investments. I think firms play a key role in the in the discussion. But I think at the end of the day, it is going to come back onto the federal uh, uh, and, and uh, state and local governments to to play that role. In terms of waiting 20 years, um, you know, the, it takes 20 years for the benefits to the kids to to really materialize. But the the benefits in terms of maintaining career trajectories of parents are instantaneous. Um, and you know, coming back to the discussion about Perry and Abbasidarian and these other programs, these high quality programs that have targeted. Uh, particular uh, low-income families, there's evidence that there are those spillover impacts back onto the parents to uh, uh, have more stable jobs and, and uh, maintain a, uh, maintain employment uh, when they're not as busy uh, having to worry about uh, child care for their kids. So I, I do think that that is an instantaneous payoff um, that has been documented, um, but you, uh, b benefits to particular firms, I think that is uh, uh, something that is a bit harder. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, my name's Amy. I live in Boston. Um, I have a two-year-old um, currently in daycare. Um, and I just wanted to make one comment to the woman who asked the very first question about parents having the conversation about the difficulty of finding and paying for um, child care. Um, it's kind of all I can talk about and all I can talk about amongst my friends, but we also do a lot of talking just to each other. Um, so we need to spread the conversation out among other people. But I have found in the corporate world at least Businesses and companies don't want their employees talking about it because it gives the impression that they're not paying their employees enough to live and pay and take care of their families. Um, so I have friends that have been approached to um, be quoted in articles and sit on panels and things like that, and their companies have shot it down um, because they don't want the conversation to come back um, to pay, and it always comes back to money. So that kind of is one of the discouraging aspects as a working parent that um, you get from your from your employer. Um, but I guess my question is, it's really hard not to feel very discouraged. And my daughter is too. Um, so we're in the middle of this and trying to think about even having a second one, because then it would be like $4,000 a month to take care of two kids. Um, and so what 
are your sort of, and I hate the term quick hits, but like what can parents, like what can I do and what can other people here do today? Like walking away from here today, like what conversation should we be having? What should we be pushing? Should we be having conversations with our childcare providers to figure out what they're paying people? Like what can we do as advocates, like boots on the ground, like right now? Because I don't have a ton of faith in a lot of the um, politicians to to do anything or to do anything that's going to be meaningful within like the this generation. So that's you know help us and give us some guidance like from this moment forward. Thank you, Amy. I'll, I'll start on that one because I actually had this experience this week in 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 Oklahoma when we talked. We met with um, a group of parents and then it separately met with a group of businessmen. And I, at the end of, the, of the, the day, I said, somebody has to get you guys talking to each other. Because I think that once we explained, as we talked about earlier, the broken business model, why it doesn't work in child care, I mean, these businessmen were really scratching their heads about, OK, so what do we do about this? And, and two of them actually said, we just need to throw this out and start again. And when you get a businessman to that level of understanding about how broken it is, then they think about it differently. And I think that, and then on the other hand, I said to them, because the night before we'd talked to parents, and we had parents saying, look, if I don't show up for work and I, because my kid is sick and, and my employer, they say, you're fired. And I, I, and I, I was talking to the businessman. I said, D I don't know, you know, are these real policies? But isn't it time for you guys to start having these conversations with, you know, somehow figuring out how to make this work for families? Because it was, it's a complete disconnect. And so I think we've got a lot of work to do on the, on the policy level, the federal level, to figure out the, the gap and who's going to pay for it. But I think the conversation has to start with, you know, right here getting more people to the table and explaining this to them. I don't think they get I really don't think they get it. Every time I do my little broken business model to businessmen, they, they stop and they think about it. Oh, you know, they had never thought of it that way. So I would say that's a step one, is get some of your friends, get some businessmen, go to the Chamber of Commerce and talk to them. Michelle, what do you counsel parents? Have, are, are they coming to your office crying about managers not understanding oh, their child I mean, care needs? Tonight, do you say I mean, to them? getting parents to, I know the parent voice is a really important voice, and getting them here tonight, the question is, you know, who's watching my kids? So we offer child care at the center and dinner and kind of everything to make that possible. But finding places where you can get that parent voice mm -hmm. to, and, you know, whether it's Chamber of Commerce or some of the, when you're going down to the State House to, to, to support a certain bill or, or something that's coming up, that is something, a conversation that we tried to begin having with parents. And again, when they're stressed about a thousand other things, it's probably the last thing they can think about. But there are times like that to get, getting them here tonight was a great win for me. I was really excited they could come and be part of this. Um, but you do have to kind of really guide it along and make sure that it's an accessible thing. So when they're complaining about things, that there's a space that people who need to hear it could really hear it. And beyond pic big picture political stage, what about someone like Amy who you know, may need to have a difficult conversation with a boss? What, is, what does that conversation look like? I think especially uh, there's so much evidence that uh, women have a hard time um, negotiating for themselves and advocating at work. Uh, they feel uncomfortable bringing up family needs. And I think some men probably experience that as well, of saying, hey, I have to take care of, of my child. And they may have a boss that's of a different generation who has not had to uh, um, carry that burden and doesn't understand the dynamics of many relationships. And that's only if you're in a, in a have a partner to help share that burden. But what would you say to someone like Amy in, in bringing that conversation forward to her, her employer. Yeah, I think the hard thing is my world is so not a corporate world. Mm -hmm. And we, I'm in an education space that really honors families and honors people being committed to their kids. And when families have those needs, it's probably a very different conversation 
you know, in an education setting than it is in a corporate setting. But I think being able to create an environment where um, people can have those conversations. So when when um, a group of and you know, I'm, I'm sure corporations realize the power of the women in their business and being able to, or the men. I think the men need to be having those conversations as well. So it's not just a a, a women's issue or a women's problem. And if you can mobilize enough people where, you know, this is a problem and I, I shouldn't have to spend $4,000 a month on two kids. There should be something in this, in this company. I mean, there are some companies, Patagonia, like that really do know the importance of honoring parenthood and how you'll get, you know, greater care, get greater quality work from parents if they know their child is there and safe or in a really uh, great child care center. Um, but maybe trying to just figure out how to build enough people that um, can support that conversation. Um, and But I also know it's a very different world than I'm in. Well, thank you all for coming out. And thank you to our wonderful panelists, Nathan Hendren, Michelle Sanchez, and Linda Smith. Thank you so much. Thank you.